It's Friday, and I'm back with the next in our Fanzine Friday series. Today we're taking a look at a special issue, the Oracle number six. Please stick around. I'm AZ Mountaineer. This is our channel, Old School Rules, where we celebrate the community of old school gamers and grognards who like classic RPGs, miniatures, magazines, and everything that goes with it. Each week on the Fanzine Friday series, I take a fanzine from my collection off the shelf for a closer look. Today, it's the Oracle number six. This is a special issue from 2016 that sort of reimagines what a final issue of the Oracle might have been like. Hope you enjoy the video. Today, we wrap up our look at a fanzine called the Oracle. You may remember last video, we talked that the Oracle number five was the final issue produced by Chris Bigelow back in the 1980s. I have this hardbound compendium, uh, the complete the Oracle. It's produced by Tim Hutchins in, uh, in, the, in the 2016 era. And one of the things that's contained in this book are a bunch of notes and discussions about the origins of the Oracle, but there's also a final uh, imagined issue, what would the issue number six of the Oracle uh, have looked like. Uh, this was produced in 2016 and he talks a little bit in here about the fact that they found some notes from one of the uh, contributors who had written some, up some ideas for the Oracle that never got published and somehow they found their way uh, to Tim Hutchins who was putting this book together and he said that made him really want to create one more issue and, and get that uh, content and print and share it. And so throughout this video, I'll share with you not only his idea of what the Oracle number six looks like, but also some of the behind the scenes material that uh, either Chris Bigelow had shared with him or that Tim Hutchins put together. All this artwork is in, the, in this, um, this version of the fanzine is done by Casey Jex Smith. It's a new artist to the Oracle. And it's just a very simple a fantasy drawing, right? With this sword and a skeletal hand reaching out for it. Let's talk about what's gonna be in this fanzine. Uh, the notes and table of contents, which again, makes very clear. There were only five issues of the Oracle ever produced. This is sort of a reimagining of what a six issue could have looked like. Uh, and then thanks to various people. He says, you know, when I reached out to folks, I said, can you give me something, make it, try to make it feel like it was from the 1980s as opposed to 20. 16, he thought people did varying levels of success with that. Um, the, the thing that generates this is this empath NPC class, and we'll show you that as well as uh, some of the notes. Um, that author uh, had also done um, some, some magic items, and I'm going to share those with you even though they didn't make it into this um, fanzine. An article about medieval cities, some reader ideas, uh, New Race Combinations is an article by Errol Otis, and he said this one's actually lifted from something Errol had been doing in the 80s. The Dungeon of Kroom, this is level three. You may recall in the beginning, they indicated this would be a three-level dungeon, but then when they did level two, it sort of felt like level two wrapped it all up, but now they've added a third level. Uh, movie Reviews, which was a particular uh, um, section in all these fanzines which is not in most fanzines so that was always fun to sort of listen to them talk about movies at the time gaming publications and the nightland as i mentioned um, chris bigelow had nothing really to do with this at all other than sharing some information tim hutchings um, is the editor person responsible for putting it together michael chrisman is the son of the gentleman who had done the empath and the magic item notes errol otis we know uh, Timothy Connolly, Bob Brinkman, Sarah Richardson, and Ezra uh, Clavery and Alan Rich all, Rich all contribute. And then again, Casey Jack Smith contributes the artwork. So here's the empath. There's uh, several pages to it in the uh, fanzine, actually a lot more than what were in the notes. The notes actually have a little bit of uh, background material. Uh, for introducing this this person who's going to be an empath and then just a couple of pages of notes. So let's take a look at those. As I mentioned, um, this guy's father, William Christman, had this notebook and the son finds it. Somehow they get connected. Uh, so, it's, so his discussion of the empath starts off with a little background story. The Wilderness of Sin Duly Dulane, I think it says. And it says, you're 16 days travel north of the last outpost of the realm. In the, in the free city of um, Haven, I believe. Don't know that that's a reference to the published city. 
You encounter a rather strange man calling himself Kulain, dressed as a druid in a dark green robe with gold trim and gold belt. He appeared to be a very learned man, able to understand the various alignment languages of your party. And he's with your party now because of a map he's brought and shown you in the tavern that reveals the location of a great city long abandoned. Although he would not sell the map, he offered to accompany you to the place shown, exchanging information for a share of the profit, as long as you also paid his travel expenses. Ahead on the road, you see a large gate and a wall of thorns that extends as far as you can see in both directions. So far, so good. This is exactly what the old man's map said to expect. But what you did not expect is the inscription on the gate, nor the condition of the gate itself. It is quite literally massive, 30 feet tall, 15 feet wide, and in perfect repair, with an emphasis on the repair. The wood is waxed, the large bronze hinges are oiled and polished recently. Kulain cannot explain this, as his information tells of an abandoned city. Uh, no skill is needed to read the inscription, which is set forth in the common tongue. Here enters San Dulane, closed to many through the ages. The bold might enter, the strong may perish, the wise shall prevail. Here enter San Dulane. Kind of cool. I like it. Uh, and this, this is not exactly comforting, is what he says. And then he has the stats for Kulain. Uh, so he treats him as a sage with two minor fields, two special fields, uh, the physical universe, physics, cartography, meteorology, geography, and the supernatural and flora. And then gives his stats, uh, excellent roles. He's got an 18 in intelligence and wisdom both. Um, so that's sort of background and context and how he introduces you to this, this NPC. I, fantastically done, I think. About as good as any NPC intro I've ever seen. Okay, so these, and again, these are his notes, right? The empath is designed to be used by the NPC to assist the party in trouble through no fault of its own. And it's basically um, a way for a DM to help you it's for low level characters. And that's one of the things they say, like sort of higher level characters have different ideas, Davis, Solars, Planetars that might come in, but who's gonna help a low level character? The empath is essentially someone who naturally um, connects and has empathy and um, understanding with others. And they, they sort of say, reminds me sort of um, like Professor X. Like the, they're constantly inundated, so they like to live a life of solitude. Um, and many times it says at some point in their career, they actually abandon being an empath. And if they do, they'll lose half their levels and become a druid. Um, they're always neutral. They tend to help people who are decent, although they don't have any particular preference for good versus evil, it says. Um, they don't have really any, they have some natural abilities, but no real spells, don't really carry magic items, only have a staff and a sling, and they basically try to get away in case there's any type of combat. In this interesting idea, they can cure light wounds, the, it's the effect of a cure light wound spell. It really only works, it says, on a, on a first level character. So they're really only there to help these really starting out characters get through some tight spots. Um, and here's their abilities, remove fear, uh, neutralize, feeble mind, speak any alignment tongue if they're touching you, uh, or thieves can't, or druidic. Um, armor restrictions of a druid, only carries a quarter staff, neutral, cure disease as a ninth level paladin, no magic items, can slow poison as a clerical spell, and cannot heal psychic damage. Most people obviously don't do that. And again, you can't really cure any wounds except for first level characters, so that's an interesting uh, spin in my view on that. And then they, again, this mentioned they travel by teleporting uh, with 100% accuracy. And basically they say if there's combat, they leave. They, even though they're trying to help you out, they're not gonna stick around for combat. Um, and that's their sort of, you know, that's their background. It's really what, what a fantastic little treasure, treasure trove. And I can understand why Tim Hutchins um, wanted to, to do a magazine to share this with, with folks. It was, it was pretty cool. Now here's his magic items, which did not make it into the fanzine, but in my view should have, because these, these kind of things were really cool. Same guy, he has three of them. The wooden spoon sticks to your fingers. It's a cursed magic item for 1d4 turns, so you can't use a weapon or a shield. Magic users can't cast spells. Clerics can't cast prayer spells. Um, only one-handed stuff, so you, they could use a rod or a wand or staff, it says for spell users. Um, and, a, and a fighter could, could use a weapon in whatever hand didn't have the spoon. It's a silly thing, I think. Um, the next one is really cool. The pouch of sling bullets. 
and you just come up with a better name. There, you roll a uh, 2d8, and in this pouch will be these, I would, he says bullets, I would make them probably describe them as maybe being of some ceramic type material or porcelain, um, because they're, there's something magical or perhaps chemical in them, but when they hit, they explode for 1d10 damage. They say it's not a spell, so there's no save against that damage. It just, if it hits, well, wherever it hits, it's gonna explode, and if it hits a, an opponent, they take the additional damage of the explosion. They point out, however, that they're fragile, and if there's any, if you drop the pouch or you take damage that hits the pouch, maybe fall in a pit, there's a chance they all go off. And one of them goes off, they're all going to go off. Um, 1d4 fireball, it says, basically this big explosion if that you accidentally um, encounter that. And they point out magic users or alchemists will not be able to study these and learn how to make them. And then finally, the trap cupboard. Let's see, somehow you find think to look at a back a false a back in this cupboard if you do it's a teleport spell It'll take you out of the dungeon or whatever um, you know cavern or wherever you place this outside no you know pet teleport without you no know, risk of damage or um, you know teleporting inside of a rock or whatever um, and then you have you roll a system shock and if you fail you fall unconscious and you lose a point of constitution permanently if you pass he wants to give you um, You'll still be unconscious, but you'll wake up with a point of wisdom. I don't know about the last little part, but it's a clever little trap nonetheless. Okay, so the next um, article here by Tim Connolly is Medieval Cities and Fantasy Role-Playing. And um, you know, I think it's just really an overview of, well, one thing, you gotta have a good city with your dungeons to make for a fun campaign. And he just goes through and gives you some different ideas of how to set that up, the kind of people you want to have in your city um, to make it interesting and to make sure you have some interesting activities occurring in there to give it sort of life and some realism, right? Um, so, you know, I think all in all, it's it's a good article and it's thoughtful idea of how to make um, make sure your cities really really come to life and don't overlook the fact that a fun a fun time in a city in between dungeon adventures is probably makes for a much better campaign. So the next one we have are Reader Ideas Spells by Bob Brinkman. This is called Portrait Eyes. It's a first level magic user spell. Fairly limited utility. You cast the spell it allows the magic user to see through the eyes of a portrait. And so you could use it cleverly, you know, maybe you give a gift of a portrait to someone with the hopes that they hang it up. Maybe you go into a, a room that has a portrait and you would use it and say, hey, I'll be able to see things. Remember, no audio, only visual. So it seems like it's fairly a limited use to me. Then we have the new race combinations of Island Town. This article is by Errol Otis. Island Town is his home campaign. And this, it's a real short article, just the one page. And the idea is that on this island, you don't only have half elves, but you have half other things. So you have like half dwarf, half human, um, half human, half halfling, halfling dwarves. And then this really cool thing, I'll show you the art here, the Mujongi, uh, which is uh, a, an odd combination where the um, the body parts don't all fit, right? So maybe you have a halfling's body with human arms. It's like his drawing here in a dwarf's head. Um, and so it's just something funky. You know, Errol loves sort of really clever, creative, unusual things. And so this is a short article with some ideas of his. So next we have the Dungeons of Kroom. This is by Sarah Richardson, and she imagines what the final third dungeon level would entail. Um, it's, yeah, I think it's pretty good. Um, she basically has come up with the idea that Kroom himself is still here with some elven guards and uh, is put a sleep spell on them while they wait for humanity to run its course in and be done from the face of the earth so that it'll be back to time when there's only elves. Some other interesting things. Again, like with all these levels, I think, nice and simple, not too complicated, not too big, and pretty well um, thought through in terms of everything that's there makes, makes plenty of sense, and I think that's the case here as well. We have our fantasy review, uh, Ezra Clav Claveria, um, and this is basically looking at the movie The Thing and saying that in the end they, they liked it, said it was pretty good, pretty scary. The thing that they talk about a lot is that they had heard a rumor 
that in a scene you're going to see some folks playing Dungeons and Dragons, and so they were really excited to go and see that scene, but it does not exist apparently. It's just sort of an urban legend. Next, Gaming Publications is going to look at the book Deities and Demigods. It's a bit of a departure, I think, for this reimagined issue number six because this normally looked at fanzines, and this is a TSR book, but it's what they picked. Um, Alan Rutch looks, looks at this, and it's uh, focused on a couple of things. One is, what do you do with these um, deities or heroes, right? Because most people's campaigns aren't set in Egyptian mythology or Greek mythology, Norse, Finnish, whatever. So he sort of says, what do you do? Do you involve them? Does it make sense to have them? He also talks about the fact that Jim Ward had written, you're not really supposed to fight these deities. They're supposed to be too powerful. And yet he gives them stat blocks, like a monster manual. And inevitably, high-level characters wanted to fight these people, wanted to defeat them, wanted to take their magic items like Thor's hammer, etc. And so, and I certainly know that I think that's what a lot of um, campaigns or, or players did. So the, and then the other thing he talks about is um, the idea that maybe what you do is you use this basically for inspiration and so maybe they're not deities and so maybe you tone them down a little and then use them as unique monsters or evil um, opponents for the players to face but not at the idea that they're defeating defeating gods probably a pretty good idea especially considering how many of these um, don't make any sense or have any connection to the type of campaign you're running it was also interesting when he talks about the uh, Cthulhu mythos and how he didn't think it was the art was well executed by Errol Otis, and I think there's a comment in here by Tim Hutchings that, in fact, now Alan really, really likes his art, but back in the 1980s he didn't appreciate it, so he tried to give an honest opinion about what he was thinking back in the 80s um, about this book. And then finally we have The Nightland. It's, this is for the Cthulhu game based on Hope Hodgson's book from 1972 and basically gives you stat, stats for different monsters and different items that the characters in that book utilized. And here's our back cover. So now let's take a look at um, some extra stuff here in this book I've been mentioning in several of my videos. <clears throat> Again, it came out in 2016. Tim Hutchings is the uh, person responsible for that. And there's a lot of extra content of notes and different things from uh, Chris Bigelow. Here's a couple of article or um, advertisements that he had to be placed in Dungeon and Dragon Magazine. His invoice, you know, from, from there, letters to TSR with his advertisements. Some ideas for different adventures that he was going to publish. Remember, he was going to have a whole game company at one point. Uh, this is called Justice Be Done. And... He's got all kinds of notes about the, the plot and the ideas, and you can see him going back and forth and changing it. There's some pages or pictures of photo, um, photos of uh, post-it notes and all kinds of different things. So here's an advertisement that he had for Eldritch Adventures, and you know he's got sort of a mock-up of what that's going to look at. Here's another one where it looks like they're on a sort of like a TSR display rack with the different uh, adventures he has. The Electric Wizard, Witchery, and El Caro, Justice Be Done against the Gadian Tons, I don't know what that is, the Deadly Crystals of Cressa, Mutiny on the Elkar Shar, Elka Shar. Um, here's another thing for announcing what's coming soon. This was to send to somebody who might want to order these, like a, like a local bookstore, and he lists them, um, starting with the Electric Wizard in 92, Deadly Crystals of Cressa, November 92, and then he has like, he has, so he has release dates, these and then over in the side you can order however many you want. I think they were five dollars a piece. He gave them to stores uh, for like three dollars a piece and so you list how many you wanted etc. And here's just another promo for that. I think this looks more like it would have been an advertisement in some type of periodical. Here's his hand-drawn map of um, something called the Westland. It's an island set setting for his adventures. Got different cities and so forth on there. Here's a more of a computerized version of that, it looks like to me, called now it's called Wisteria. And then he's got this catalog of Wisteria, I think where he lists different town cities, locations on the map, and then is putting in there like which um, campaign adventure he's working on is gonna be in which, in which different location. And then he's got some notes about his campaign. Here's a city called Zenoria. I think it's Zenoria, maybe it's Zandra. And this is, I think that's where they have the setting for the electric wizard. Um, 
and this is an interesting one. It's a the idea is a crossover. You're going after a wizard that's been transported to you know the 21st century, in the 20th century, I guess. Um, and then he, he's got something in here that reads like it was a little bit of a novel he'd started writing. And then he's got this part which is um, looks like several pages of the beginning, and he just goes like this and stops. And so, just like that, also, we've come to an end of our discussion of the Oracle fanzine. This was the reimagined idea for an Oracle number six. Uh, and that's it for our look at the Oracle. Next week, we will start something brand new. I've got a couple of things that have come in I'm kind of excited about that uh, we'll take a look at before we move on to um, a new series. And I've got a couple ideas for that as well. If you guys have ideas of, of a particular fanzine you'd like me to talk about, you can always stick those down in the comments. Hope you're enjoying the uh, series. I hope you're enjoying our channel, and I hope that you're subscribed. Also, I hope you, if you have some friends who might enjoy our content, please send them our way. May Hopefully, they can be subscribers as well. Have a great Friday. Have a great rest of the week. And until next time, my friends, keep rolling 20s.